All right, Chem 11 students. Today we are going to be looking at the determination of chemical formulas. All right. Um, it seems like hard stuff, but it's actually pretty simple. It's not that bad. And it's going to relate back to um, converting moles into grams and that sort of thing, which we've already done. And I think we're already probably pretty good at. So if you can do that, then this isn't actually that hard at all. So let's start our lecture. So what if you discovered the cure for cancer, right? Well, you'd probably have to go up to your country's Ministry of Health and say, hey, look, I, I found this cure. Um, quick, let's make lots of it. And of course, Ministry of Health will say, yeah, here, here's a ton of money. Let's get cancer solved. What's the formula of your drug? And you'd be like, well, I got it from a rare species of plant or animal or whatever it happened to be. I, I don't know the formula. Right? You need to know that formula. You have to be able to determine the molecular formula because, of course, you'd want it, you know, you'd want to be able to make as much of it as you can very quickly for Canada, but also for every other country in the world. And you'd want Canada, the Ministry of Health, to, to send out, you know, that alert, you know, to the countries of South America and Africa and Europe and Asia and Australia. Hey, we have this. Start making it. It cures cancer, right? It's going to save a ton of lives. So, you have to be able to determine the formula, right? Now, it's not that hard to do, all right? And like I just said earlier, if we have the ability to go from grams to moles, if you can do that calculation, which was stuff from earlier in the same unit, then you're good to go. And we are going to review this, so don't worry about that. All right, so that's what we're gonna do. Now, a machine that helps real chemists is a machine called the mass spectrometer. And what it does is it measures the molar mass of a compound. Now, the molar mass, if you remember, is very important if we're gonna go either way in this little equation here. The molar mass was this, it was the grams per mole of a substance. Well, the mass spectrometer is a machine that does that for you. So if you put a sample of your, you know, cancer fighting drug or whatever it happens to be into the mass spectrometer, it will give you this molar mass, the grams per mole for every molecule of that cure, right? So whatever the chemical is, it'll give you the molar mass. It can also give you a reading of each element in the compound based on mass and a percentage of that of how that element appears in the compound and here's basically what what we're talking about this was taken from the Cassini spacecraft which flew out past Saturn and this was a reading taken as it flew by one of uh, Saturn's moons and we can see here now of course you can you know our, our notes are here up in the corner and I'll write stuff here but in this little table that's in our notes you can see the mass of elements and you can see spikes and I'll just draw a sample one here. We'll get rid of this. And I'll do a sample one for you really, really quick here to show what we're talking about. So this mass spectrometer. Oh, I'm going to run out of space. I am terrible. Mass. Spectrometer spectrometer it looks like so again what it can do is water is something we want to find right if we're sending out a spacecraft we want to know is water out there and so what it will do is on this side it's percent and on this side it's mass all right very sloppy writing today sorry about that and so the higher the spike, the higher the percent that that element exists there. And then the mass would, you know, be rolling at one, two, three, four, five, six. You get the idea. Seven, eight, nine, ten, blah, 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 the rest of it, right? We'll skip a few. We'll go 15, 16, 17. And this would just continue on to the goes through all the elements. Now, for water, we'll see a couple of things. All right. If we go by elements, so you turn it on so it's measuring the element, water has two hydrogens and an oxygen. 
And what it will do is it will say, well, again, if it go by the mass of it, I know that this is 16. So it will have a spike at 16. All right. It'll flat line through all of here. And it'll have another spike at hydrogen, which is 1. So when I read this, right, if all we tested was water, not all these other chemicals that we see here, I'm going to it afterwards. I'm going to go, oh, okay, so that's, that's hydrogen. And the mass of the element in its uh, 16, it's going to be oxygen. All right? So I look, what element has a mass of 16? I go to the periodic table, it's oxygen. So I know that this compound has only hydrogen and oxygen. And if I look at the percentage of it, I can see that hydrogen has a lower percentage than the oxygen, right? And the, the percentage is based on mass, percent composition, right? So I know that oxygen accounts for more of it. Well, if I think about that, this is 16 and this is 2 times 1, which is 2. So this is 2 out of 18, which isn't very much, and this is 16 out of 18, which is a lot more, right? So out of the 18 units of mass for water, oxygen is 16 out of the 18. That's why its spike is so high. That's like, you know, 80 some percent, right? If I look here, the hydrogens, two of them, and they're 1.01 a piece, but I'll just round it off. Two times one is two. Two out of 18 is like 9%. So if I go up to here, that'll relate to nine, and this will relate to about 90, right? Because the majority of the weight is the oxygen. So I can determine a, a, a formula using the percent composition, right? And that's kind of what this is giving us, the percent composition. Here's the elements. We use the mass to determine the components, and here's the percent. So the mass spectrometer can do that. Another thing it can do is if you come across molecules and you don't know what molecules are in a sample, you can set it where it goes by molar mass. So again, if I do the water thing, I know the molar mass is 18 for water, right? 16 for this oxygen. And then 2 times 1 is, well, 1 and another 1 is 18 when, com you know, combined with the 16. So it will do this. It'll put a spike there at 18. So by using the two sets of data, I know that there's some hydrogen and some oxygen from the first reading. And I know the molar mass of the compound is 18. I can figure out that the formula of that compound is water. All right? So that's kind of where we're going with this lecture. So, before we do that, we have to learn about the law of constant composition. And basically what that means is, when you get a compound like water, those elements that make up water, they're there in fixed proportions, right? For water, it's two to one, right? Two hydrogens for every one oxygen. So for water, the proportion is two of these two, and we don't see it here, but there's a one, two to one. Two hydrogens to one oxygen. That's my ratio or proportion. Water, it's fixed at that. No matter where I go, if I have two to one hydrogen to oxygen, wherever it is in the world, wherever it is in space in the universe, it's water. All right, if I have two hydrogens to one oxygen. If I change it, kind of like our little joke of the two guys going to the bar, if I change that ratio, it's no longer water. It's something else. In this case, it's hydrogen peroxide. It's two to two instead of two to one. All right? So a lot of constant composition says, look, every different compound that's out there has its own unique formula, its own unique setup of atoms. And so if glucose is C6, H12, O6 in Canada, it's got the same glucose, will have that same formula in China. It'll have that same formula in America. It'll have that same formula in Australia. On Mars, the same formula. All right? So that's it. That's what the law of constant composition basically says. When you determine a formula, 
and you see the ratio of the elements, you know what it is. There's no, there's no arguing, oh, H2O could be something else. No, it's, it, it's water. H2O2, oh, could that be water? No, two to two is peroxide. There's no other way, you know, no, no other chemical that it could be. Glucose, it's got to be 6 to 12 to 6. That's it. All right? So water will always be H2O. That's it. You find H2O, you found water. All right? So empirical versus molecular formula. So before you can find the molecular formula, you have to find the empirical formula first. All right, so the empirical formula is what we're going to be looking for first. If we can get this, then we can find this. We can find the molecular formula. The empirical formula is the formula in lowest terms, right? That's a math term, right? Lowest terms in math means basically we have an answer that's 4 out of 8. You start working it down in the lowest terms. So I cut those both in half. It's 2 out of 4. That's still not in lowest terms. I can cut those in half. There's lowest terms. Right? And in math class, we've all done that. We've put this as an answer or this, and then the teacher takes off half a mark or a mark because this is the right answer. All right? So lowest terms. So I'll put that in here. Lowest terms. It's the lowest whole number ratio for that formula. All right. Now I can see my PowerPoint. There's another point that went here. I don't know. It's supposed to compress onto this one screen, but it looks like it stayed large. So I will write down what it says underneath it here. The molecular formula is the real deal. Right? It's the actual formula. All right, so for example, for glucose, the real deal is that glucose is C6H12O6. That's glucose. If you went to the mall and ran into your good buddy glucose, that's what you'd see. Six carbons, 12 hydrogens, six oxygens. If you ran into glucose at the metro because you're grabbing some groceries, this is what you'd see. Six of these, 12 of these, six of those. If you ran into glucose at the movies, that's what you'd see. It's the actual form. It's, it's when you see it out in public, that's what it looks like. All right? And that's what this says down here. The next point would have been the molecular formula is what you see when you go out and you meet this thing out on the street. When you meet it in real life, what's it going to look like? Glucose will look like this. Six carbons, 12 hydrogens, six oxygens. The empirical formula now, if I look at that, these are all even numbers, 6, 12, 6. I can reduce that down. I can divide this by 6. I've got 1, 6 here, 2, 6 is here, 12, and 1, 6 is 6. So my empirical formula for glucose is C H2O. And I know technically, even though we don't see them, there's two little ones here. So my lowest terms or empirical formula for glucose is this. There's a 1, 2 to 1 ratio. Just like here, there's a 1, 6, 2, 6s, and 1, 6. 1, 2, 1. So glucose is C6H12O6. The empirical formula, lowest terms formula for glucose is CH2O. All right? We will always have to find this one first, the empirical first, before we can determine the molecular formula. All right? And that's what that said underneath it here. When you run into it out on the street, what will it look like? What's it really going to look like when you run into it at the movies or the mall or wherever? And then underneath that was an example. Glucose is this, and there's the empirical. That was the next point. Uh, it enlarges it here. I'm not sure why. So, we know we have to find the empirical formula first. If we're going to determine the real formula, because this is the one we want, right? We want this, right? We don't want to know this. This is, this is lowest terms. I want to know the real thing. If my cure for cancer has a formula, I want the real formula. I want to make up the real chemical that's going to go in there and fight the cancer. So I want this. 
but I have to find this first, right? Of course, in chemistry, nothing is easy, right? Um, so we've got to find this first. And then once we have this, we can figure this out. All right? So usually what we have to do to find that is have one of two pieces of information. All right? And the mass spec kind of gives you one of them. So to get the empirical, to find this, what really helps is percent composition. All right? This will probably be given in the question. This percent composition can also be given to you by the mass spectrometer, that machine we talked about, right? The mass spectrometer, if you remember, hydrogen at one was a little spike, and then blah, 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 all the way to 16, and that was a bigger spike. That was percent composition. So we can use that data to find the empirical, and once we have that, we can use that to find the real deal, all right? So let's try an example of a problem here. So I'm going to write down the steps in larger, in larger letters here. So this is to find the empirical. All right, to find the empirical formula, the first thing we have to do, all right, is one of two things. We need grams. So we gotta get grams, all right? Now, here's the thing. If we're given percent composition, that's in, that's in percent. So what we do there is we assume 100 grams and when we do that what happens is percent simply becomes grams so for example if carbon may you know if, if we do a percent composition and carbon was 40 percent well if we have 100 grams 40 percent would be 40 grams out of that 100 grams if oxygen was 52 percent right then we would know that oxygen if it's 52% composition by mass, we have 100 grams, which is mass, it's gonna be 52 grams out of the 100 grams. That's why it's 52%, all right? So we'll go through and we'll do, we'll, we'll keep going here, but so if we're given percent composition, simply turn your percents into grams, because we'll assume 100 grams of it. If we are already given grams, then we just leave it, all right? We've got grams. So some problems will give you this. Our first problem here gives us percent composition. Other problems might give you grams right off the get-go, and then you don't have to do this. You get an easy first step. The second step, formulas are based on amounts. I'll write that down, are based on amounts, right? For example, water has two amounts of hydrogen for every one amount of oxygen. Two amounts of hydrogen for one amount of oxygen. Every water, two to one, two to one, two to one. So, amounts in chemistry means moles, right? Whenever we hear the word amounts, it means moles in chemistry. I'm in mass, but I know how to convert grams into moles, right? So I'm simply going to run that little calculation, right? And I'll use the molar mass of each element to do that, right? So I'm going to divide by the grams per mole for each element. So carbon is going to be 12.01, right? Oxygen will be 16. Hydrogen, 1.01. These are the masses off of the periodic table. Those are the molar masses for each element. All right? That'll give me moles of each element. Then I will divide by the lowest moles. When I divide by the lowest mole number, that will give me the ratio 
of elements in the formula. All right, so I'm gonna do a question on here. I tried to set it up on here. I added in this, this problem here. It's, it's on your lecture notes, I added it in long ago. So it says the substance that gives sour milk its lovely taste is lactic acid. Lactic, lactic acid, maybe they ran it through a mass spectrometer, consists of 40% carbon and 6.71% hydrogen with the remainder being oxygen. So lactic acid is going to have three elements. There's carbon, hydrogen, and it says the remainder is oxygen. So it says determine the empirical formula. That's what we're trying to find, right? The empirical formula here for lactic acid. And we know it has these three elements. Sorry. What we're trying to find now is the numbers that go in here to give me the formula, right? And it says, or else, right? We're tough talking in pandemic times here. So the first thing I do is I take the 40% for carbon and I turn it into grams, it's 40 grams, right? I have to get grams. And if I'm given percent composition like I was done here, I assume 100 grams and my percents simply become grams. So carbon, I see here is 40%, it becomes 40 grams. Hydrogen was 6.71%, it becomes 6.71 grams. And it said with the remainder being oxygen. So all I did there was I added the 40 and the 6.71, and I subtracted it from 100, because we knew it's percent composition, which is out of 100, and I got my grams of oxygen as 53.29. All right? So if I take 40 and 6.6, uh, 6.71, I add these two together, subtract it from 100, I get my grams of oxygen. Pretty easy. So I've got grams of each element. That's step one, I've got my grams. Step two is taking the grams of each element, 40, 6.71, 53, 29, and I divided it by the molar mass for each element to get moles. So if you look carbon on the periodic table, it's 12.01. So that's the molar mass for that element. So I take my grams of carbon and I divide it by the molar mass for carbon. And I got moles. I got 3.31 moles. I then took my mass of hydrogen and divided it by the molar mass for hydrogen, which is the same as the atomic mass on the periodic table, and I got 6.64 moles. That's for hydrogen. And then for oxygen, I took the 53.29 grams, I divided it by the molar mass for oxygen, which is the same as the atomic mass on the periodic table, that was 16. 53 divided by 16, I got 3.33. So I converted them into moles, which is what I wanted to do. So now I have 3.33 moles of carbon, 6.64 moles of hydrogen, and 3.33 moles of oxygen. The next thing is to divide these mole numbers by the lowest moles. If I look here out of my three molar values, my lowest mole value is 3.33. Both of these elements, carbon and oxygen, have that. So for carbon, I take 3.33 moles and I divide it by, well, 3.33, because that was my smallest mole number. And of course, 3.33 divided by 3.33 is one. 6.64 divided by 3.33 is two. It's 1.97, we round these off. If we can, we try to make these full numbers. And then, of course, oxygen was also 3.33, which is, it had a share of being the lowest. I divide it by 3.33, I get 1. So this means that my empirical formula is C1H2O1, or CH2O. All right? I don't show the ones. So I follow these steps. If I go through that again... I have to get grams. I was given percent composition for three elements, carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen. I turn the percent, because I had percent composition, I can assume there's 100 grams and turn my percent into grams. 
So the percentages in the question simply became grams. And here they are here, 46.71, and I told you how to find the 53.29. The next step is turning the grams into mole, and I divide by the molar mass for each element. Using the periodic table, carbon is 12.01 grams per mole, hydrogen 1.01 grams per mole, oxygen 16 grams per mole. I divide each of those values by their own unique molar mass off the periodic table. And I got moles for each element. The last step was divide by the lowest mole number. I had 3.33, 6.64, and 3.33. I divided it by the 3.33 because that was the lowest number. And I got 1, 2, and 1. That told me in my formula I have one carbon, two hydrogens, and one oxygen. 1, 2 to 1. All right, so this is my empirical formula. Now, lactic acid may not be this, All right? Its formula could be CH2O, but it could also be C2H4O2, which follows that one, two to one ratio, All right? It could be C10H20O10, C100H200O100, right? It could be C5H10O5. It, it, anything that is one, two to one in a series of numbers like that in that same pattern, it could be that. I don't know what lactic acid really looks like yet. I don't know the molecular formula, the real deal. I just know the lowest terms is this. All right? So for that reason, empirical is not enough. All right? When I looked at glucose before, glucose, right, was c 6 h 12 O6, if I go lowest terms with that, it's CH2O, which is the same as lactic acid. And lactic acid and glucose are not the same thing. Definitely not the same thing. So you can have it happen a lot where two totally different chemicals with different properties, if you reduce them down, they can have the same empirical formula. So it's good to know the real thing. So empirical is not enough. So what we want to do now is, like we said before, we want to change the empirical formula into the molecular formula. We want to get that real formula, the real deal. All right? So I'm going to erase this. So what I really want is the... We want the molecular formula. This is the real deal. When you run into this thing out on the street, wherever it is, this is what it's going to look like. In order to find this, I need one, I need my empirical formula for it. Well, that's good. We just figured out how to find that. I also need the molar mass. Now, how do we get the molar mass? Well, the mass spectrometer will give us that too. If you remember for water, I said it can do the element thing, so it can give you a spike at hydrogen and oxygen, or I can do the molar thing where it goes to 18, which is what the mass of water is, and give you that spike. So there's two readings. This one is percent composition, but this one is molar mass. So the mass spec is a really, really, really important tool in chemistry. So the mass spectrometer will give us the molar mass. For water, it was 18.02. Right? In fact, there's a picture of the, of the mighty mass spectrometer. Right? This thing, the work that it has allowed us to do in chemistry is amazing. Very, very important machine. Right? We applaud the mass spec. Anyway, so let's do another problem. Now, I know these problems are worked out on the iPad. You can follow along with your own notes and listen to what I'm saying. I'm going to do another video after this one that shows step by step where I'm going to be doing all the calculations. I didn't, you know, not cheat and go through here, but I wanted to, you know, go through this quicker, so I did it on here. I'll have another video where I work out several types of problems and it'll be, you know, right from scratch on the whiteboard. So sample problem number two.
the molecular formula of a compound containing 85%, 85.7% carbon, 14.3% hydrogen by mass. So there's only two elements here, and I know that because 85.7 and 14.3 add up to the 100%. All right? So it says, basically, they ran this thing through a mass spec. Carbon and hydrogen are the only two elements. So it's a hydrocarbon of some sort. And we have to find these numbers right here. So we want the molecular formula, right? We want to know what the real thing is. Right? And I'll put real here. We want to know what the real formula is. What's the real deal here? What are these numbers? All right. So what does it give us? It gives us percent composition. Now we know in order to find this, I need empirical formula and I need the molar mass if I'm gonna solve this. Well, the molar mass I got, the molar mass they said is 84 point, or 84 grams per mole. So there's my molar mass, I've got number two. Nowhere on there does it give me a formula of any type. So I need to find the empirical formula. To find the empirical formula, I can use these percent composition values. All right, so we're gonna follow the same steps we just did. So we don't have the empirical formula, but we do have a way to get it. We're gonna use that percent composition. We're gonna do the assume 100 grams, turn it into grams, convert our grams into moles, and then divide by a lowest mole number. So if you look here, I took the percentages and I converted them into grams, 85.7%, 85.7 grams. 14.3 for hydrogen, 14.3 grams. I simply turn the percent into a G for grams. Then I divide by the molar mass, I turn them into moles. Carbon's molar mass is on the periodic table at 12.01 grams per mole. Hydrogen's molar mass is 1.01 .01 grams per mole. Now, you're thinking, well, this molar mass here is 84 grams per mole. Where does that fit in here? These are the elements. This molar mass is for the elements combined into the compound. So I don't use 84 here. I use carbons off the periodic table and hydrogen's mass off the periodic table. So when I divide these numbers, I got 7.136 moles for carbon and 14.16 moles for hydrogen. My last step to determine the empirical formula was divide by the lowest mole number. So I've got 7 and 14. So I divide by the 7. Both of them get divided by the 7. And of course, this one's easy. It becomes 1. And this one becomes 2. So I now know that my empirical formula is CH2. Very simple. I just used the previous slide's work to do that. So that calculation isn't too bad if you follow those steps. So now what do I do? I use this information along with this. And what I do is I take my molar mass for the compound, which was given, 84 grams per mole, and I divide it by the empirical formula mass. My empirical formula mass, there's my empirical formula, and it's got carbon. Carbon is 12.01. And I've got two hydrogens. Each hydrogen is 1.01. .01. When I add that together, it's 14.03 grams per mole. So the molar mass of this empirical formula, I divide my molar mass of the compound by that. So the molar mass that was given, 84, I divide the 84 by the 14 and it ends up being six. And we can see that here, the grams per mole on top divided by the grams per mole here, it's gonna, you know, grams per mole divided by grams per mole cancels. So the units are all gone and left with six. What does that six mean? What does this mean when I see it here? That means that this is lowest terms. We know the empirical is lowest terms. It means that the real deal, if I ran into this compound out on the street, 
It's six times larger than this. It's six of these. So if I take six of those empiricals, what would I end up with? I know this is little one. Six times one is six, and two times six is 12. This is my molecular formula. My empirical was lowest terms. It was a one to two ratio. I figured that out right here. I found out that the real thing by running this little calculation, taking the real mass and dividing it by the lowest terms mass, the empirical mass, I found out that the real thing is six times larger than this empirical. So six, and I just multiply these subscripts by the six and I get the real thing. All right, so if I ran into this compound, you know, out at the Speedway in my hometown, or at the Oshawa dump, or at St. Mary's School, wherever, it would really have six carbons and 12 hydrogens, not one and two. There's what it really looks like. All right? If you're really keen, you caught on to the tragically hip reference in that last little example. Anyway. So it means that the real molecular formula is six times larger, that's what this is saying, than the empirical, so you multiply it by six, which is what we did down below here, and we found out that our real formula is C6H12. Easy enough? I hope so. Now, here's another type of sample problem. This is our last one in this lecture. And what this one says is determine the molecular formula so we can... You know, we got to find the molecular formula. So the question is the same, which is the real deal, right? That's what we call the molecular formula, the real thing. And it says the empirical formula is P2O3. And it has a molar mass. And this time the molar mass is 222 point, oh, sorry, 220. Careful, 0 0.0 grams per mole, all right? So in the last question, I had to find this. They gave me percent composition. They didn't give me the empirical formula. I had to work to get it. In this question, right, this sample problem, they gave it to me already. So that's fantastic. It cuts out that first calculation. So I need the empirical formula. I got it. The question hand fed it to me. I need the molar mass. The molar mass will always be given in the question. It's right here. So we cut out some of the work. We just have to do that last calculation, right? So what we have to do here, since we're given the empirical formula outright, is we take our molar mass, which was the 220 grams per mole, and we divide it by the empirical formula mass. So what I would do to get this was I would take 2 times phosphorus, which is 30.97. I'm going to add it to 3 times oxygen, which is 16. These are the molar masses on the periodic table. And that equals 109.94 grams per mole. And when I grams per mole divided by grams per mole, they'll cancel. You can already see 220, and this is basically 110. The answer will be two. That means that the real thing, right? Remember, this is lowest terms. This is empirical, that's lowest terms. The real thing is twice that. So if I go two times P2O3, my real formula is gonna be two times two, which is four, and two times three, which is six. So my molecular, the real deal, is twice the size or twice the mass of the empirical. And so I do that. Two times my empirical is the real deal. All right, my molecular. And that's it. So our next video, I'm going to not have the iPad here. I'm going to move that out of the way. And I'm going to work through a bunch of these problems with you from scratch.
So I'll be doing all of this stuff. It won't be kind of cheated there for me. So you can get an idea of, of how to attack the problem. Um, maybe you already did with this. Hopefully you did. Um, but we'll, we'll go through it, okay? So this is kind of our theory and how to. And then we'll do the practice in the next video. And that's it. I know it's a lot. But I think the chemistry is stuff we've already done. So it's, hopefully it's easy. All right? So I'll leave you to it. What I'm going to do is I'm going to make up that other video a little bit later today. All right, go through this one, see if it made sense. I'm going to add a sheet to our D2L where we're working out empirical and molecular formulas. So that's going to be in our D2L uh, classroom page. Take a look at it, and then that's the same sheet that I'll start working out problems to. If you want to give them a try yourself, by all means do it. All right, go out and give it a, you know, give it a shot, and uh, we'll go from there. All right. Talk to you soon. Hope it was clear. If you have any questions, comment in the comment section below this video or reach out to me through Edsby and I'll be more than glad to help you out. All right. Talk to you soon. Bye-bye.